Abby, welcome to the Vitality Women Leading Audaciously podcast. I am so happy to have you here. And we're going to be talking about, of course, your story, um, but dating. Really fun topic. Really a fun big topic. one. Yeah. It can be fun, frustrating, all the things. That's true. And yeah, well, we'll do more on that. But, but I'd love to start with your story. Like, what led you to this? And um, how did you come to this place? Yeah, I feel like I'll try to do the abbreviated version for you because I think I could probably take the whole time <laughs> with just that. Um, but I, honestly, this business started for fun. Um, I didn't really anticipate it being a business or being a way that I made money in any way. Um, you know, I was a serial dater. I was on every dating app. I was going on multiple dates a week and I honestly could not keep these men straight. I was dating in the least authentic way I possibly could. Um, but, you know, I was kind of having fun doing it. So, you know, that's all right. Um, and I ended up meeting my now husband that way. And I saw my, so yeah, you know, I met him online and then I decided, wow, all my friends are doing the same thing I was doing. Why don't I just like start you know, setting them up and trying to find the people and running their dating apps. So it has evolved in the past three years to not running people's dating apps, but to setting people up on blind dates, hosting singles events and helping, you know, just bring more love into the world. And it blows my mind. This is my full-time job, uh, you know, helping people navigate dating and, you know, just talking to people all day about how we can achieve their hopes and goals and dreams about love. Oh, oh my gosh. So, so beautiful. And congratulations on finding Thank the love you. of your life and getting married. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, exciting. It's, uh, it's been, I think, 37 days now, but who's counting? <laughs> oh, that's really precious. <laughs> Right. It's kind of funny. I was uh, with my grandparents the other day who've been married for 65 years mm. and we were like trying to figure out and how many minutes and how many seconds added on to that. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. Hearing that story makes it gives me so much hope. Um, I'm not even sure where to start. There's so much I want to unpack about um, dating apps and dating. And, and, and one of the things, the women in our audience are all trying to balance life, right? They're, a lot of them are moms, entrepreneurs, and um, wives. And oftentimes what leads, to, what ends up happening is, you know, some kind of burnout um, or some kind of disease, um, divorce, and then absentee parenting, right? So all of my work revolves around how to prevent those things from happening because I really believe in love and I really believe in family. And I believe that we can and have, we can do it all, we can have it all. I, I, I sincerely believe that. I don't think it's some kind of pie in the sky, um, you know, in unattainable goal. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women are like resigned around dating. You know, it's like, I'm in my forties and fifties and it's just not going to happen for me because I'm just not a hot commodity. All the guys my age are dating women in their thirties, late thirties or early forties. And it's, or you, you gotta be, you gotta be with a guy that's much, oh, there's just so much like, you know, a lot of us like have these jokes about like, you know, swiping left, like I'm going to get arthritis, you know, because I just keep swiping left. You know, there's all these funny jokes, you know, but it's real. And, and I just get the sense that there's this like resignation around dating apps, authenticity. Um, and so I just have to just briefly, I know I'm talking too much, but I just, want to um, set the stage. So I married my husband. I knew him for six months and I got, I got married. I was like the love of my life. And then my whole world kind of fell apart and I divorced and moved back to the United States. And I was like just single for like six years. I'm a serial monogamist. So I, unlike you, I don't know how to date and it's really uncomfortable for me. So like many people too. Right. But three years ago, I decided to like, okay, I'm going to start dating. So I like you, I was like dating by, by the fourth date. Like if you're not putting out, like they're like, what's wrong with you <laughs> as a serial God. monogamous, I can't like, you know, sleep with a bunch of guys. It's just not yeah. possible for me. Right. <laughs> so I, that would be overwhelming. I don't recommend that at all. <laughs> well, then again, though, like telling your story and like representing yourself. So I had like from three to five, five days a week meeting guys. And I, I had like a, I was like on the verge of starting a spreadsheet because I too couldn't keep track of it. Like it was really <laughs> overwhelming, but it was really helpful. And in the end, I did meet somebody, but it wasn't through a dating app. So um, I just would love to get your insight on 
dating as a mom in your forties, as an entrepreneur, like what, what do you like, what kind of advice can you give women or what kind of guidance can you offer? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot we can talk about in that realm because, you know, as if you are in your forties, you've probably been married. If you have a kid, maybe not. Um, I deal with actually a lot of women who have kids on their own and then they also want to date. And that almost adds a whole other layer of, um, actually sometimes less complicated if you're not Mm co-parenting. Um, but I think, you know, some of the key things are, you know, really making sure or trying to have a civil relationship with a co-parent, um, because that can definitely bring in a lot of toxicity into a future partner, future relationship, um, you know, and also not talking about that person when you're on dates. Um, That seems pretty self-explanatory. Although (laughs) they're always an invitation. So what happened with your ex, you know, and it's like, you got to be careful that you don't want to throw them under the bus, you know, but then you don't want to be too like lovey-dovey about it either. It's tricky. (laughs) It definitely is. I would say, you know, for the first couple of dates, there's no reason to even go there. You know, <laughs> of course it's a part of your life. And if it comes up, you don't need to say, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I definitely advise people to set some boundaries around how much they want to share about their ex. And you can kind of set that with yourself before the date. You could say, hey, you know, date one, if I get asked that, my boundary is I say, hey, you know, that happened. It's in the past. And, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, or you can say, Hey, you know, we have a good relationship, very civil. That's all I want to say about it. Um, I definitely advise having something, some boundary you've set with yourself of here's what I'm going to say, because it might come up, it might get asked about. So just to kind of be prepared for something like that. Um, I think it totally is okay to talk about your kids on a date. Um, you know, as long as that's a positive thing, if that isn't, if you feel like that would take you to a negative place, maybe don't bring it up. Um, you know, because that's part of you too. So, you know, I think dating as well, if you're in your forties is tough as a successful woman, because there is a whole range of men (laughs) that you're going to run into, I think in any age. And they're super Um, intimidated by like a a strong, put together, powerful woman, you know, they're, they, they're like, Oh, like she's a bit much. Yeah, that is one of the biggest things is for super successful women, you know, who are maybe more in their masculine energy and making all the decisions during the day, you know, to then be like, okay, I'm going to find a man who's my equal, hopefully even more successful and amazing than I am. Um, Because, you know, that would, will definitely make things a bit easier unless, you know, you don't want to be dating someone who's, you know, still living in their mom's basement and, you know, doesn't have it together. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And I mean, even getting to that date, um, I find that a lot of my girlfriends are saying, you know, I, I just can't find quality men. And then when I think I do, they're not willing to make a commitment. So I think love in your forties or fifties is really different than it was like in my twenties and thirties, because we have lived a little bit more life, maybe a few relationships under our belt. Um, <laughs> No pun intended, actually. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's, it's different. I don't, I, it's so like getting onto the, so I'm really good at like picking, like seeing a picture and being like, that's quality. That's a quality person who may have shared values with me, which I think is huge, by the way. I finally did meet somebody on the dance floor. <laughs> How cool. Yeah. <laughs> and like, shockingly, we had such wildly similar values. It's like so cool. Um, mm-hmm. And it makes, it's just like so much, so much easier than um, having to educate somebody um, on just, just, we just, it's just like common ground and we can like rise from there, which I love, I love, I love, I love. Um, yeah. But like even getting on that first date, like having someone like you is, is really important because it sounds like it's almost like a concierge, like you are a matchmaker. Yes, I am indeed a matchmaker. Um, and you know, what I do is filter through all the people who would not be a good fit. So, you know, of course you can do that yourself. You could go online, you could go out and about, and you could meet tons of people and, you know, figure out what you do and don't like. Uh, But that's really where having a matchmaker can be really awesome because you just say, okay, here's me, here are my values, here are my goals, here are my dreams. And then here's what I'm looking for in a partner. Here's my ideal relationship. And then I go and interview everyone 
you know, before you ever meet them. So, you know, if you're like, Hey, I could never date someone who doesn't value compassion, you know, (laughs) seems like a high up there for most people, but you know, for some people, their values may not align with that. Right. Or even, you know, to children or that are infants, you know, like age, age group. And there's all these, like, you know, I think I don't say deal breakers, but you know, preferences, um, to get to the table. And that's one of the big things to a piece of advice I would give to anyone of any age of any sexual orientation or preference who's dating, write down your top three to five values and then your top three to five like deal breaker, non-negotiable items and have those with you. You don't need them on a date, but you know, have those in a journal somewhere, or have them in a note on your phone mm-hmm. so you can keep revisiting them. And mm-hmm. if someone comes up with one of those red flag items, uh, you know, you can definitely make a note of it. Maybe it's one where, you know, get the hell out of there, yeah. um, you know, and kind of make sure you're always aware of those things. Cause those are the things that I'm using, you know, to determine who to introduce to whom, um, and, you know, there are matchmakers all over the world, uh, oh, doing yeah. what I do. Oh, I know it's like awesome. in certain faiths, you know, like in, 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 in traditions and cultures, like it's a, it's a very, very esteemed uh, profession and it takes some pretty unique skills. And I, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of women I talk to, like they have these relationship patterns and it's like, they don't even trust that their chooser is working anymore. It's like, I just tend to attract like wildly uh, self-absorbed men <laughs> or you know, it's like, it happens. It's like, what is up with these, you know, there's this, this whole trail of men that, you know, are unavailable or, you know, why am I attracted to that? So I think it's so helpful to have somebody like yourself who can kind of cut through it all and, and, and listen to what that person actually wants and, and, and help to find that uh, because it, it can be really overwhelming and challenging, especially when you have this pattern, because we got to break these patterns Um, and there does need to be love. And so I'm in the health, you know, the health world, but also the personal development world. And so there's all this talk the last 20 years or so about like self, the individual and our work, you know, and how, when we love ourselves, we can then love somebody else. And I agree with that, but I also have noticed that I'm really happy on my own, like super easy. No one to answer to, (laughs) I do what I want, when I want, how I want it. You know, it's like, yeah. and there's great. nothing wrong with that. Yes. And the moment I'm in romantic relationship, it's like my whole world turns upside down. Mm. And I think that the richest ground for personal development work is found in relationship because that person is reflecting back to you things you really can't see about yourself. And I used to think that it's all in me. And I do still believe it's all in me, but having somebody there is, is been so confronting and so valuable. And I think that that's the greatest opportunity for our personal development and work and growth. And I think it even comes from friendships and family relationships, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic one. Um, You know, a lot of my work I've done on myself is like, whoa, actually looking at how my relationships are with all these people around me. Totally. There's just something about that intimate relationship that's so close, so close, you know, they're just like right there. Right. And even if you can view dating as an experience like that, where you're learning about yourself and you're growing as a person with each date and each new person you meet, you know, that will just help immensely as you're meeting these people that maybe aren't a good fit, but trying to take away something like, oh, okay. I just learned that I only want to date uh, someone who is this religion by going on that date. Great. You know, that was an amazing experience and an amazing date for you. Yeah. And like for people who are like, you know, codependents, like oftentimes the stating is so challenging because they're like, this has to be the one, you know? And it's like, it's just, it's, it's hard to like, you know, have a bunch of people, you know, to, to choose from. And codependents also tend to um, only go for people who choose them as opposed to who they choose. Right. Which, which is, is tricky. Which is tough. <laughs> right. I don't know that I've ever been in a relationship where I'm the one that's chosen. I just can't say ever, but it's kind of risky. It's like, if you want something so badly and that a person isn't, isn't mutual, like that level of rejection is intense. Who? 
I have felt that one and I will never forget that rejection. <laughs> mm, it's tough. And, and so it's like, oh, well, if they choose me, that takes that off the table. <laughs> right. And then we don't have to make ourselves vulnerable to potentially being rejected. Um, but, you know, there is something to, you know, of course, being picky in a good way, um, you know, with who you are dating. Um, you know, there's always- no shortage of people on the planet, right? Yeah, I actually, um, I have some fun statistics on this. There are 50 million single people about in the U S which you hear is that? Than, Did yeah. you hear that ladies, <laughs> 50 million single people, probably half of that men. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> 25 million men out there, guys looking for their dream lover, their dream partner, their dream wife, their dream. Exactly. All you need is one. So one. This, yeah. we got this. So, I, so I'm, 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 I'm really wanting to emphasize this because I'm reading this book. You might know it. You might not called deeper dating. Have you ever read this? Oh book? my God. I love that book. I recommend it to everybody. Ken page is amazing. So yeah. <laughs> my, I did it like, cause my friends were doing it and they're like, okay. And then you need a partner while you're doing it. So I was like, it was like the first assignment. And I didn't even know what the book was about really. So I was like, okay, I better get a partner. So now I'm like, and she's like, okay, we're going to meet every Friday at 11 to talk about it. I'm like, oh my God, I, re- I got to really do this because <laughs> it's like a workbook. So yes. I, I mean, even if you're not like, I'm not actively dating um, more than one person. Like I'm in a relationship now I can say, mm-hmm. and um, this has been really revealing. And, and I I'm bringing it up because you're talking about being choosy. There's no shortage of people who are looking for love. And I think I have a doubt that like the guy that I want exists. Mm-hmm. Like I have like a real doubt in me because like, I want too much. It's unrealistic. And of course my daughter also doesn't help. She's like, mom, you're never going to find like a, a good, a good partner for you. Cause you're just like, you know, you're just too much. <laughs> I'm like, great. <"Great>, hey, <laughs> like, don't you want your mom to be happy? And she's like, yes, of course. Um, no, but it's really, it's really funny. I'm just using that as a kind of an anecdote, but, but yeah. I think what I, what I'm learning in this book is that the more you can be yourself and not what the other person wants you to be, because we, as women are experts at that, by the way, we know exactly what people want us to be. So not conforming to that, knowing what your values are, what your priorities are, what you're not ne- going to negotiate on and what, who you are, like the more you can bring that to the surface, the more you're going to be able to sift through these guys faster. Exactly. I am the biggest fan of that book. So I am so happy that we're talking about it and that you're reading it. Um, I actually have a, on my podcast, did an episode with Ken. Um, <gasps> if you want to learn more, I can, I can send that one to you. Yes. We should all listen to it. He's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's the biggest takeaway for you because I've just started the book, so I don't actually know where I'm going. That's definitely one of the big ones. And I think also learning that, you know, the things that you may think are challenging about yourself or flaws, or maybe things where you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to find someone who will be okay with this thing. You know, also accepting those Um, because sometimes like a lot of that fear or, you know, whatever kind of emotion that's coming from that is because we haven't been like accepting of that thing, you know? So, you know, something that I have an example of myself is that I am, you know, I'm a bit of a micromanager. I will definitely admit that my employees will also agree. Um, but it's something that, you know, I'm working on, I acknowledge about myself and I was always afraid I could never live with anyone or any guy because I would just like micromanage the hell out of anything he did. Um, So, you know, once I kind of accepted like, hey, this is just part of me, you know, we'll communicate about it, we'll be good. You know, I even felt better about that thing. That's beautiful to hear. I would say mine is like intensity. I can be really intense, like unrelentingly intense. And and then it goes to like the too much thing. And then it's like, I've spent so many years like trying to dumb it down which isn't, isn't a good idea either, mm-hmm. um, but to like channel it in a way. So I was identifying my greatest gift, which I think is to heal, but I think Ooh. also this intensity around healing too. Like I'm, I'm like only interested in like the human condition and health. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. I have been for like 30 years. And, um, and my partner, I was like, I, we were identifying his gift 
And it's like, I direct, you know, and it's so interesting because like now that I'm like aware of his gift, I'm, I'm like, oh, like I, I want to just allow him to, to direct. I love that about him, you know? So it was really cute. We went to REI yesterday because we're going to go camping. Nice. And like, I, I was like, oh, here are the stairs and they were closed. And he's like, can you just let me direct? I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's the director <laughs> I love it um, that's awesome and look just like how happy that makes you feel to know that thing too yes it's huge you know there's none, none of this like nah, 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 nah. um but also like as you said earlier this masculine feminine um because you know usually when you're single and you're in your, your 40s or 50s you've had to kind of do it all and manage it all so you've had to own that masculine energy and dating has really helped me to like Oh, like I really want to be in my feminine energy. And these are the practices I need to cultivate that so that I can show up in my feminine energy. And that was a big shift for me when I started to date for the first time in my mid forties. <laughs> and that's okay. It doesn't matter when you make that shift, you know, in it's interesting too, in, you know, heterosexual relationships, you kind of like, you know, the man traditionally is in his masculine and the woman in her feminine, you know, when you first start out, of course, there are times where you go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, that dynamic is important and being in your feminine, I think a lot of people think is like, Oh, being weak or letting the man make all the decisions and order my food for me. Um, you know, it's definitely not that at all. It's more just kind of like, Hey, we don't need to figure out how to get to point A to point B. We're just going to go figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Giving yourself permission to like dance inside of it. But I think I was so in my masculine energy, I was attracting men who embodied more of their feminine energy and it was a turnoff. And so I would meet all these amazing guys, literally checked mm -hmm. every box, but like the, the dynamic wasn't right. I'm like, mm -hmm. I just did. It just did. It was like, why isn't there an attraction here, an authentic attraction? And I realized, oh, I needed to work on embodying the feminine more so I could invite in a man who could, you know, who, who would be wanting to hold that space. Cause I think we, we even, even you being the, the matchmaker herself, you know, you still have to, there's still like a, a lot of things at play is what I'm trying to say. Like what we're manifesting, attracting, creating, you know, um, at any given time. Cause I just think that's such a huge uh, opportunity to learn about ourselves when we're dating. And I want to encourage women to not be resigned, whether you're um, heterosexual, bisexual, um, or gay, whatever it is, like there is someone out there for you and, and don't be resigned. I mean, rise to the occasion to learn about yourself, what you're attracting, what you're embodying, what you want, what you don't want to stand in your power, to know your worth, to embody your gifts, to show up and be willing to say, Hey, that's not for me. You know, that's such a beautiful practice. And another thing I want to add too is to also just be honest with yourself. If you don't want to date, you definitely don't have to, um, you know, and dating burnout is a real thing. I see where people sort of feel this pressure. Like I have to date, I have to go and date every week or a couple of months. And if I don't, Oh my God, you know, I'm going to end up alone forever. Yeah. You know, those dates are not going to be fun if you're coming from that place. So please true. also, this is your per permission to take a break. And maybe read deeper dating. Uh, you know, out, you can ask me about a million other books too if you're a book person and want to reflect in that way. Um, but you know, taking time between relationships too, even between dates, is key to reflect and think about. Okay, did I like that person? Do I want to see them again? What did I learn about them and myself? Yeah, and even letting go of it, which is what I did, because I dated for a year, and both guys that I was in, that I ended up, you know, kind of developing a relationship with, changed their careers and moved out of the country. Not kidding. What? So I was like, yeah, and um, and these were guys who were established in their careers, like forty year careers, you know, very successful, wow. men. and yeah, they literally changed their careers and moved out. I'm like, what? Like, do I have like a career change catalyst, like thing, like, I don't know what is going on, <laughs> but like, I was so bummed because they were amazing men. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to invite in the partnership that I'm in right now if I, you know, so all good, but I was totally taking a break. I'm like, I'm done with this dating thing. It's never going to happen. I'm not saying that's a good thing to do, but I, I took a break and it was in that break that there was like this space that opened up. 
Mm -hmm. And then this guy just kind of literally just like danced into my life, (laughs) walked into my life. Yeah. It was (laughs) kind of cool. It was not kind of cool. It was amazing. It's a miracle. And it's totally um, something that's beyond our comprehension of why it happens or how it happens. It's so primal. Right. And that is the kind of like indescribable part that makes my job, you know, kind of interesting and difficult and fun all at the same time. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just get this feeling that two people want to meet and then that'll, you know, happen. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm hiring for a matchmaker right now and I'm writing this job description and I'm like, who is going to apply for this job? (laughs) Well, you, you know, doing what you're doing is going to figure that out, right? I mean, <laughs> it's going to pre-qualify and I love that. Right. So if, you, if, you, if you're a natural matchmaker out there, <laughs> definitely reach out to her. <laughs> yes. If you're an intuitive empath, uh, can lead with your heart 75% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love that there isn't an algorithm, you know what I mean? Because there, the algorithm is something so much you know, the AI, like this is something that's so much more than keywords. Let's just say that Um, so much more, Abby. And I really appreciate this human element to what you do. All right. So how do you um, manage it all? Because you started this company, you said three years ago Mm -hmm. and uh, you're a wife and an entrepreneur. So what is it? How does it, how do you do it? How do you hold it all together? Uh, You know, very good question. I don't always hold it all together. So I just want to be like very honest about that, that if you're listening and you're like, she seems like she has it all together. Not true. Um, There are plenty of days that I'm just like, what did I get myself into? Um, (laughs) So I just want to be clear about that, that I don't know. I don't believe that anyone has it all together all the time. (laughs) I don't see how that's possible. Right. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But, you know, I really manage by like scheduling my days a lot. And I know that sounds like it might make it more stressful, um, but I used to kind of just have my calendar online as a free for all for anyone and everyone. Um, And instead now I have certain parts of the day for certain things, um, you know, like recording podcasts. I try to do those only on like Mondays and Friday afternoons because that just seems to be my time. I'm best at recording podcasts. And, you know, talking to new clients, I have certain times I only do those things. So really like segmenting out my days and then always blocking off time in my calendar. It seems silly, but put in my calendar to eat meals with my husband, to go on dates with him and to work out together, which is another thing that we love doing together. Nice. Um, I love it. So he always thought it was silly that, you know, we had a shared calendar like six months into our relationship. Um, But (laughs) that honestly saved us because, you know, then you know what the person's up to. You, you know, we're both working at home too. So, you know, not to bother them if they're in a meeting, um, all that good stuff. Well, that's also like taking your micromanaging gift and applying it for the greater good of your yes. health, your life, your balance, you know, or harmony in your relationship. So that's like, that's a beautiful expression of the integration of your gift. Thank um, you. That's so beautiful. Cause I've every gift, you know, has both two sides, right? My mm-hmm. intensity, for example, can like, you know, make people be like, Hey, I need a break. <laughs> Or it can be like, oh, I'm really drawn in right now. And this yeah. is incredible. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always double-sided. And I love that. Um, uh, some women find um, the the whole, oh, I, what I'm hearing is boundaries, right? Your, your structure, you're clear, yes. but how you're spending your time. And I'm sure there are exceptions, right? Where things come up. But mm-hmm. um, I'm also finding that there's inside of that discipline, there's a lot of freedom actually. Right. Yeah. Well, and that too, you know, um, I used to work, you know, a normal job, not as an entrepreneur. And I was doing both at the same time. Uh, I had no time for anything. So I think that was also a big turning point because I was basically working my TV job from 4 a.m. to noon and then doing matchmaking from like noon to eight. And I was a not human zombie. So uh, this year I have uh, started not doing anything before 10 a.m. And I said this in a women's group and they all looked at me like I had 10 heads when I said No, that. it's legit. I totally <laughs> love that. And then you come into your day and you're ready to go. And you're like totally right. energized and you're, you're, you're way more productive than if you had rolled out of bed and just started your day. So I'm a huge fan of that. 
Um, and so when you're really tired and worn out, like, what do you, what, would, what do you do to, to resource yourself? Ooh, this is a good one because honestly, this is something I am actively working on and I am not the best at because I am the burnout queen as my life coach says. Mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm really good at just like continuing to work when I'm tired. So, you know, I am instead when I'm tired, I'm just not going to work. I'm just going to actually take a break. And that might be 10 minutes. That might be the entire day. Um, you know, kind of depending on what I'm feeling, uh, because my job is so much dependent on me having the energy and attention to people if I'm not feeling it, and I'm sure this is so similar for what you do, yeah. I'm honestly doing a disservice to my clients. Yeah. You know, an energy is cultivated. It's a given, right? The sun is going to rise and that's energy. You know, everything mm -hmm. is energy, but like, and it will set and we have only so much in a day and we have to cultivate it. And it's tricky because if you know burnout's your predictable pattern, and I'm sure a lot of women listening can relate to that. Oh, burnout yeah. is a predictable pattern and it catches up to you in your fifties and forties. And sometimes sooner, um, it will catch up to all of us at some point. So it's, mm -hmm. it's tricky, but yeah. coming to that realization is huge. Yeah, it was a, it was a big turning point for me because I look at, you know, pretty much most of the people I surround myself with are also burnout people, you know, they'll be like, Oh, it's 10 PM. I'm going to go back to work now what it's something we endorse as a culture and especially women today yeah. because this is really the first time in history that we haven't needed a man for survival mm -hmm. um because my grandmother and great grandmother did so true my and grandmother still doesn't drive never has you know yeah. like she always relied on her husband to do that it's a beautiful thing. I have no mm -hmm. judgment around it, but I am really clear that we are in a different generation. I think it's Esther Peril that really first brought it to my attention. I mean, of course it's logical, but it really changes the dynamic of the role of relationship and, and how we uh, come into our fullness as women. And burnout is a predictable outcome. And, and that, I don't want that for anybody. So either. I think we don't give ourselves permission because it's so socially acceptable, more so, I think, in the United States than anywhere else, because I've lived abroad before. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and it's just something that I think we all need to give ourselves permission to find the balance. And like you said, um, I'm not any good to anybody if I'm burned out. I can't actually serve and do my purpose, live. Right. And I don't think it matters, you know, what job you're in, you know, if you're burned out and exhausted. You know, if you're a chef, your food's not going to probably taste as good that day. If you're an accountant, maybe you're going to mess up someone's quarterly taxes. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so but, you know, I feel like I wish we could all give ourselves more time to have more time, you know, just like the space to relax and breathe. Because I think just in the U.S. mostly, we're just trained, okay, on to the next thing. Where's my to-do list? Uh, you know, what can I get done today? Yeah, and it seems counterintuitive, but it's not. Um, so I hope that everyone can hear that. And this is a much longer episode than we usually do. So Abby, thanks for your patience. <laughs> Uh, oh my God. I'm sorry. I could talk for hours. I think we could have like three episodes. You and yeah. I. <laughs> I mean, dating is a huge topic. So I'm really curious what your feedback is for those of you who are listening, what you'd like to learn more about, please do let, let me know, let us know, uh, because this is a really big topic. And I, and I do believe that no matter how old you are, um, you know, big, small, you know, gay, straight, you know, whatever. I, I know there's love waiting for you. And I know that love is always the answer. And I know it's the most fertile ground for growth and self-development. So oh, with that being said, if you are looking for the love of your life, you should call Abby. You definitely should. I would love to help you chat with you, um, you know, see if we would be a good fit. Um, is now my time to plug everything where people can reach me? <laughs> Absolutely. How do we find you? <laughs> um, so you can go to my website, modernmatchmaking.club. A little different, but if you work with me, you're part of a club. Also, dot com was like six grand. Not doing that. Um, so <laughs> modernmatchmaking.club. Um, you can see tons of info on there, figure out how to sign up. Um, you can also email me, abby at 
thesocialmm.club. So my business is The Social Modern Matchmaking, and I am based in Colorado, but have a network of matchmakers all over the country. So if you are not in Colorado, I can still help you and send you to one of my amazing friends that can also introduce you to maybe an amazing person, hopefully an amazing person. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And I think that's all the things you need. I also host a podcast called The Ghosted Podcast. Um, And that you can find anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, uh, you name it. I don't even know all the places. The Ghosted Um, Podcast. Yep. It's a good one. Yeah, I bet. I bet. (laughs) That's so cool. I'm definitely going to check it out. Mm, I love that. We're going to have to do an episode together on there. <laughs> we'll cross over. And um, uh, yeah, I would love to help anyone and everyone who is not finding the right person. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a big, big topic. And this whole commitment phobia. I mean, there's just so many avenues to, <laughs> to go down on this topic. But it's, it's yeah. been such a great learning process. And it just must be so much fun, like when your clients get married and um, when they're having a good time and also when they're struggling to, to help them. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, both situations are rewarding. You know, when you pull someone out of this depression of, I hate dating and I'll never find my person. And then, you know, being at someone's wedding that I helped facilitate, um, you know, it's the best. Yeah. It's such a soulful mission that you're on. Yeah. And it's so wonderful that you have your own success story, that, you know, with your marriage. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you know, 37 days and counting. Hopefully we make it to 65 years, you know. (laughs) I hope so too. I really do. (laughs) Thank you for being with us. And, um, yeah, I wish you tons of success and all the women who are going to contact you and may you all be blessed. Thank you.